representation. Now, and since the papers come out, we've got some feedback, so we did good, and some get a little hesitant, and there's been some kickback. And to be honest, we were surprised by this, because when we were discussing the paper in its initial uh, stages, one of the things that came was, is it really worth writing this paper? Because the conclusions were so obvious, unambiguous, and non-controversial, we thought we'd really be preaching to the choir, and there just there isn't just too much to say. So yeah, we were surprised by the kickback uh, we got from some quarters, and I think uh, I'm going to use this opportunity to provide our perspective in the paper and, and answer some of the concerns that may be raised. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> this is a speech presentation uh, session, and uh, the multi-species coalescent and is obviously one of the more popular, um, not the most popular, model for species limitation out there. So I'm not going to go into the mechanics of the model, but I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of the terminology. When uh, Renal and Yang first described this model formally in 2003, the paper referenced it as the censored or truncated coalescent. And this is a very good description of the process that went on. And it wasn't, as far as we know, until 2009 and the three review by Deglin and Rosenberg that the term multi-species coalescent was applied to the model. And this was to <coughs> emphasize that the samples that constituted the data for the model came from many different species, as opposed to the original co uh, coalescent, which was just one species. Now, despite the term multi-species coalescent, and despite the fact that there's a species tree that's produced by the multi-species coalescent, it's important to bear in mind <coughs> that the species tree is not a tree of species. This is self-evident when you look at the model. There's a single population parameter per branch of that model. And it's also there in the verbiage of the paper. If you look at the really careful and precise way Degnan and Rosenberg defined the model, uh, the model is used to assemble separate coalescent processes occurring in populations connected by an evolution group. There's no doubt it's unambiguous and there's never been any issue that we're dealing with a tree of populations here that later on you go and make a statement about species on. And so the species tree can only be taken as a tree of species if you assume a very, 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 very specific idea of what species are. Your species are your, these pan-mictic, idealized, right fisher bags with no structure within them whatsoever. <clears throat> now, if the original term, the sensor coalescent or truncated coalescent, had stuck, or we always kept in mind the precision uh, and care with which the term multi the multi species coalescent defined the model. Or we had actually adopted a more accurate and precise term, the multi population coalescent, instead. Perhaps we wouldn't be here, this paper would not have been written. But yet, here we are. <laughs> and um, so the paper came out, and as I said, that we heard a lot of different things. And one of the comments that came back that I really appreciate it because it sort of converged with my viewpoint completely, is this paper should not have been needed. But unfortunately it was. So we're not making a new statement here. We're just pointing out uh, something that we thought was fairly obvious. So let's give you the simple argument. Let, let me just get one thing out of the way. I love the multi-species coalescent. And moreover, <laughs> after doing this work, I am in love with it. I really, really, really <laughs> love this model. I've always liked it, but now I think it's one of my favorite models of all of evolution. <laughs> so the multiple species coalescent is a wonderful, beautiful, elegant, robust model that models structure in genetic data. And structure is a very precise, explicit definition here. Disruption of right fissure panmixia. So the multi-species coalescent partitions a set of individuals into a set of right fissure populations. If and only if your species are panmictic bags with absolutely no structure at all, and our and your data reflects that, only then can you consider the multi-species coalescent a perfect or clean species limitation model. Otherwise, you have to use other data, assumptions, or analyses, either post hoc or uh, a priori, to take your results from the multi-species coalescent and do your species limitation. So let's talk about <clears throat> one of the central assumptions of the multi-species coalescent, or more specifically, the assumption you make 
when you use the multi-species coalition to do your species limitation. And that's treating your species, your splitting events as equivalent to speciation. So when the ancestral population splits instantaneously, instantly, and without any pause or lag, they speciate into two daughter species. And to be, again, specific, the splitting is modeled by the multi-species coalescent. The speciation is your interpretation when you use the multi-species coalescent as a species limitation model. Now let's contrast this with another model of speciation. Speciation is a process as opposed to speciation is an event. And this decouples the splitting event from the speciation event further down the road. This is lag between the population isolation and development of the species. Speciation occurs after the splitting event, or it may not occur at all, depending on when you sample your system. There may be lineages that just even haven't begun to uh, their road on the species or halfway down that road. <laughs> so we wanted to ask, when you give the multi-species coalescent data generated under a process, under a model that assumes speciation is a process, how does it perform? So all the other tests have been done with uh, I've run that model, essentially, speciation is that. So that's what we did. We generated data under the protective speciation model at the end of all, and this is a model that decouples the splitting from the speciation uh, processes. And essentially, it's just like you can think of the that model with a speciation uh, rate, uh, process laid on top. And it's, the speciation is controlled by a conversion rate parameter. At low rates of conversion, speciation occurs much later uh, than the splitting event. And at high rates of conversion, speciation occurs really close to the splitting event. And we can imagine really, really, really high rates of uh, conversion. It's, in some aspects, it converges onto your birth death model risk. But speciation is instantaneous and coincident with splitting. So I'm not going to go over into any of the details on the, on the analysis. That's all in the paper that I had. I'm just going to jump straight into the results. So what we have here on the uh, x-axis, uh, different species conversion rates. Uh, so over here we have a, a species conversion rate that's a thousand times faster than the population isolation rate. And over there we have something much more realistic. And on the y-axis we have the number of species uh, estimated by the or most species coalescent. And we can see, as we might have completely predicted, at a uh, really high uh, species conversion rate, as we converge to the birth depth model assumption of the multi species coalescent, we use a species limitation, uh, we get close to the actual number of species generated, five, and at much, much more realistic species conversion rates, the multi species coalescent grossly overestimates the number of species. That's because it is not estimating species, it is estimating right fisher populations. And we see this again when we uh, generate a much wider variety of uh, situations and uh, large, a larger number of species. And again, we generally see what the multi-species coalescent is estimating has no relationship at all to the number of species actually in your system. Because again, it's not estimating species, it's estimating units that indicate disruption of right fisher of Amnesia. Now, a lot of this depends whether you're a half glass, half empty, or glass, half full kind of person. And I'm a glass is always full, just a question is it full of air or water or something in between. <laughs> and this was the result that made me fall in love all over again with the multi-species coalescent. Because what we have here is the multi-species coalescent doing an incredible job of tracking structure in the system. So when we just look at us, uh, trees and don't ask whether they're species or populations or something in between, we just want to know what the structure is. And we take the multi-species coalescent results as indication of that structure. It does a fantastic job. And as you see, if you look at the paper, the data we generated were coming up in really, really challenging situations. And it does a fantastic job of tracking it all the way down the line. This is a remarkably powerful model, the multi-species coalescent. And that is actually part of the problem. So let's talk about the gray zone, the ontological gray zone of speciation. And that's in this area when we it only emerges, of course, when you do think of speciation as decoupled from splitting and requiring some time before isolated populations are evolved into full species. And all that, of course, is inspired by the Duqueros' general lineage concept of the species framework, in which, depending on your species concept, you might call it one or two species. 
folks, regardless of your species concept, the multi-species coalescer, given enough data, is going to give you two species here. It's got nothing to do with your species concept whatsoever. Enough data, it's going to pick up that structure. It's going to pick up the disruption of right fish and mixia. It's going to tell you that two species. So you might have the best species concept in the world for your system, but your data is going to drive whether you get one or two species, and not in a way that, that is coordinated with your species concept. And we can take a step back and imagine a system sampled today uh, with the fine resolution sampling that occurs with data sets today, uh, sp fine spatial resolution as well as fine uh, genetic resolution. And so we have a system that in some cases we have full species, in some cases we have full populations, in some cases we have something in between. And depending on your species concept, you may see anywhere between four and six species. Given enough data, the multi-species coalescent is gonna zoom in on every ounce of structure in that, or no ounce of structure in that system. It's gonna tell you that six species. Even though when we want to consider full species, uh, full speciation, we're only looking at four. So, <clears throat> To reiterate, the species tree that's produced by the multi-species coalescent can only be considered a tree of species under a very, very, very specific framework. Species concept, if you like, it's not quite that much. And that's if you assume your species has absolutely no internal structure whatsoever. Or your, and more importantly, regardless of the subject, your data has no internal structure within a species. And the fact is, given the type of data we're collecting today for most systems, that assumption is increasingly being violated. We're doing fine scale spatial sampling. We're capturing a lot of structure that goes well below the species level, even below the full population level. And that's compounded by the fact that we also collect increasing our data resolution in other ways, a genomic data scope. And so we're giving the multi species scores more and more power to see these fine scale structures. Given enough data, the multi-species person will pick up any structure in data, whether or not that structure is due to species or populations or something else. <coughs> so, this is the way forward with it. And the first thing, as with it, a lot of problems, we have to acknowledge its existence. And we have to acknowledge that what the multi-species coalescent is tracking is structure. And it requires corroborating data, evidence, analyses, assumptions, a priori or posteriori to go from that to species. I suggest maybe we start calling it the multi-population coalescent to emphasize the fact that the, tree, the species tree is actually a tree of populations. And of course, the, the natural next step is to take this beautiful model and make it work in the context of being used for species mutation by actually incorporating speciation processes into the, uh, the Living in the speciation process on top of the right culture by fishing population. So. And that's all I have uh, for you guys today. Uh, the slides are available online, uh, and the paper's there. Thank you all. as to why you chose not to include migration or population structure in your simulations? Yep. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, we do have population structure, of course. Uh, and, uh, you know, it emerges in a natural way. The, the fact of speciation model generates the splitting of ancestral populations, and then layer on top of it is the speciation event. So, we, we have Disruption of right fish of mixia providing our populations. We don't have anything below that. Uh, and so, on the top of the gene flow thing, and I'm glad you brought this up. Then. Uh, one of the issues that has come up, and people have said, well, this story only works for this really specific species concept that you have. That's simply not true because we're not actually operating on a species concept. And uh, you mentioned migration and gene flow. And this, Lacey told me not to get into this, so, but uh, <laughs> that's why the slide's back over here. <laughs> migration, there's this gray zone of speciation that we're all familiar with. What migration, the gene flow does, is it creates another gray zone, but this is an epistemological gray zone. And given enough data, the multi-species coalescence is going to punch right through that. And 
And so we, the reason we didn't do it, we wanted to have the ideal system. But there's one more thing I want to talk about. And people are quite happy saying, well, the multi-species coalescent has the species concept of a cessation of genes. And that's my species concept, so I'm OK. But how many of you here think that that's the species concept underlying the multi-species coalescent, cessation of genes? You know, it's a trick question, don't you? Because it's not cessation of gene flow, it's restriction of gene flow. And there's a big difference. And there's a huge, huge space between full gene flow, panmixia, 1.0, and no gene flow, 0 0.0, which is where your species is. In between, with enough data, even the slightest amount of lack of restriction of gene flow, or a lot of gene flow, the, given enough data, the multi-species coalescent is going to see through that and say, as here we go, there's a right tissue population limit right here. So gene flow adds noise to the system, to the multi-species coalescent. And given enough data, it'll pass through that noise sufficient times. So it's not really addressing the multi-species coalescent as it is, doesn't see gene flow. And there are models that actually model gene flow within the multi-species coalescent. But all that's doing is taking care of that noise and cleaning it up. It doesn't address the species concept issue, which is full restriction gene flow. And also, I think the problem we have now is we don't have a model right fisher populations. We have a definition of the species, but we need to acknowledge that rejection of a right fisher population doesn't automatically mean species. There are a lot of other things in between that space that if you use the multi-species concept, uh, species concept, multi-species coalescent concept blindly, you are going to call them species. Any other questions? Thank you.